Abbey Road, probably. Same. If I have to pick. I, yeah. I always want to say the White Album because that's like the cool kids say the White Album, right? Is that yeah, what the cool kids I mean, the say? White I think so. <laughs> you know, the you White know, Album. Yeah. You know, for but, me, it's uh, got to be Abbey, Abbey Road. Yeah. Abbey Road has always been my favorite. Not necessarily like the mark of equality, but it just has so much. What the Beatles were and the effect that they had on everything, that's the climax. For me, it's evident in, in listening to it. And I, I don't want to make like a big commentary on Abbey Road. It's just awesome. That's what it, why, it's, why it's the best album. Welcome to this Broken Mixtape, the podcast that rewinds and presses play on the soundtrack to your life. I'm Jeff Wu. And I'm Justin Lee. Off the Cuff has been a leader in Toronto's menswear consignment retail space for 25 years. Owner Lee Romberg curates the shop's clothing and accessories with the panache of a GQ stylist. We sat down with Lee to discuss the evolution of Off the Cuff and men's fashion, watching music legends like Roy Orbison and Simon and Garfunkel, and how he was able to rediscover his favorite albums in flak format. Today our special guest is Lee Romberg. Welcome to the show, Lee. Thanks. Hey, Jeff. Justin. Happy to be here, and I'm ultimately a music fan, so... Lay it on me. Yeah. Well, we're glad to have you here. Thank you. So I've been a frequenter of Off the Cuff for, I don't know how many years, maybe like 10 years, something like that I've known you. that, yeah. Yeah. So. so a lot of our listeners might not know, maybe you could uh, share with them what Off the Cuff is. Man, it's evolved over the length of time that it's existed, but I guess I could best say, or to me, it's a kind of a gem in the middle, in the back of an alley that has a magic quality to it and it has my rubber stamp of anything that goes in there. So I kind of like view it as a place you can trust and mm-hmm. and find, you know, any taste or genre in terms mm-hmm. of fashion that you like, as long as it's really good. And then just reminded of maybe the the way we come to sit here, all, all of us, it's also a place where a lot of talk happens and people meet and other people meet other people while they're there at the same time. So it's got this magic quality to it that has been a running thing about it, I guess, from day one. And it's not just about fashion, but it's, it's just, it's just like a one of a kind kind of place. Yeah. Like there's changed over time. There's been a lot of times where I've been there and I've met other customers other frequenters of the shop Mm -hmm. and they're there looking for stuff and they're also there to see you and just kind of like just chat about (laughs) whatever it is guy shit yeah guy shit (laughs) a lot of times not and not not a lot of times but yeah i in fact that happened to you there was somebody there yeah i'm uh recently i think there was like a director there i think right or a commercial yeah 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 so yeah the name isn't coming to mind his name is chris yeah that's right chris yeah so yeah so this happens, you know, on the regular. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say on the regular, but when it happens, it's it's kind of you go like, this is happening more than one might expect. Mm-hmm. So what's that about? Yeah, you know, and it's I get to have like the front row seat to it, so it's really kind of cool. And that's kind of who I am at the at, or what it's a reflect. I think anything we do is is a reflection of ourselves mm-hmm. in one way or another. And then there's all these iterations of that over time, and as as I said, it's changed. So. You know, it's, it's, I'm always, I thought the other day, like, I put myself in someone else's shoes rather, or, or you could say put their shoes in mine. How does this work? It's kind of mm-hmm. vice versa, but instead of thinking what other people want, I kind of think what I want and put it in their shoes, if that kind of makes sense. And then, you know, all this stuff happens there, you know, while that, you know, with that kind of model, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. You're curating a lot of the clothes that are there. Right. Right. And you're also helping people find what it is that looks good on them also at the same time. And then at the same time, you're striking up a conversation, getting to know a lot of the different people that come through. For sure. The reason I do that is because I want to know what their what someone's life is. Mm -hmm. And these days it's less, you know, it's less so that someone needs advice or styling. I think that that's kind of like going the way of the dodo. Mm -hmm. People are so savvy and and the internet and all all that, right? You don't need a stylist necessarily, you Mm -hmm. know? Oh, stuff. But (laughs) I try to still like when someone's there for free or whatever, Mm -hmm. that's not a shameless plug. It just happens to be the case. You know, 
I want to know what their life is about and why they why they're there and what they're needing. Mm-hmm. If they start out saying they need something, sometimes you can just browse. It's fine. I'm not going to be like all over your ass about it. But I'll find out information about someone so that I can retrieve, like you said, something that's appropriate. So would you say that's something that differentiates you from other like consignment shops or vintage shops? I know, I mean, you're not really dealing in vintage. Everything is mostly new. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a couple of vintage pieces. <clears throat> but yeah, the, we'll deal with important vintage mm-hmm. and not, I guess, the rock t-shirt in Kensington Market per se, uh, you know, to give you a, mm-hmm. like a basic idea. It wouldn't be that. It would Rather, it would be, you know, if someone had... Jean-Paul Gaultier eyewear from the 80s. Mm-hmm. I'd be all over that to bring it in. It's mm-hmm. such beautiful, you know, if you, it's just such incredible, unique, yeah. um, metallic, cra- yeah, it's it's art, yeah. it's sculpture in glasses. And certainly, surely, there's other eyewear of the now that either tips its hat to that or, mm. or you know, exists in, in and around it, uh, outside of it, I mean. But that's the kind of vintage that you would find. Otherwise, we're all about modern, Streetwear, mm-hmm. uh, hype, and luxury accessories, and a little bit of business, but always the high-end luxury, cool. modern aesthetic. Yeah, is what it is. Yeah. Sorry, uh, how did you first start the store? Like, how did it come to be? Family business. It was started by my mom in '93, which actually is now. Uh, now that you mention it, it's the 25 year mark now. Oh wow! Yeah, and. She was going to sell it uh, a number of years ago, and I told her, don't do that. And so I just kind of started being the face of it. And I was there from day one, but mm-hmm. um, a lot of stuff in between happened that that I won't get into now. <laughs> that's that's a long, long story, but yeah. So it's, and there, as a, uh, there's been so many iterations of it, it's completely different than it mm-hmm. was back then. And I, you know, it's evolved over many times over over that period. When she was running it, was it mainly menswear still, or was it? Yes, yeah. yeah. For a little while, there was some women's wear in there, and we will at this time deal with it as well again. But it's it's always been it's going to actually evolve. The fact is, it's it's evolving as we speak, and there's going to be things dropping that that aren't yet that haven't yet, and and. It, I feel like it'll be less about menswear. After all, um, well, one thing I can prove that by is I'm probably going to remove the word menswear out of the name of the store, which it, mm-hmm. it technically has. And secondly, I'm always photographing women in men's clothing. Yeah, I just dig it. I think it's I think it's amazing, and I think that the 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 blurring the li- the blurring of the lines of of um, fashion and gender is a is a great idea. And and we see that again. It's it's just it's just it's nothing new at mm-hmm. this point. It feels so like yeah, so to me. But you know, so then you don't have to d- only have menswear. And there's a lot of girls shopping uh, yeah. in the store now. Is is that by word of mouth or they're just passing by? I think it's a combination of social media, word of mouth, mm-hmm. uh, foot traffic less so because the store is this tucked away, hidden yeah. at the end of a an alley Mm -hmm. as you know right so Mm -hmm. you kind of have to hear about it Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of that for sure i feel like that's part of its charm that's part of the you know one of the things that it has going for it is the fact that it's not just a well-known it's a well-known story but it's not like everyone knows it right you kind of have to it's like a secret club kind of yeah it really is and and something i i kind of love when i hear and i've heard this a couple of times or a few times lately, someone will say, it kind of feels like I'm in my closet. And first I go, are you fucking nut? Like, what? Don't say that. But then I go, wait a second. Right. That's, that's a, that means it's comfortable for somebody. Mm-hmm. And it's, it is cozy. And it's, it, 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 it's always been intended to be that way without pretense, without um, frills even. Yeah. You know, so, so that it's just all about the real deal. You know, the purity. Mm-hmm. It's sort of the fashion counterpart to, there's a store in Leslieville called Tiny Record Shop. And mm-hmm. our first episode uh, featured Trevor, uh, the owner. 
it started just because he wanted to have this personally curated record store. So there's maybe 2,000, 3,000 pieces. Mm -hmm. He started off with 1,500 pieces, and everything in there is of great quality, no matter what genre it is. And I think that's kind of like your store. Most of it's high-end labels, a lot of great stuff that you won't see anywhere else, and it's all curated by you. Really, right, yeah. And that, it's a great analogy. It's something I think that it's taken me this long, even as an aside, to, to really be home with about having the confidence in yourself to just say, this is how it is. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't know what they want. And then when the, the person who's providing what they think they want doesn't know what they want, it, the, things go south, right? So mm-hmm. it's really important for no matter what someone's doing, what you're, whatever you're up to, to really be like, you know what, even if I fuck it up, even if it's wrong, I felt that this was right mm-hmm. at the time. And I'm giving my best to that, per, to you know, to whoever I'm serving at the time. And the tiny record shop is clearly all about that as well. It's clearly, you know, has set out to do that very thing. Mm-hmm. And then I would appreciate that as a customer because I know that I'm not going to waste my time, mm-hmm. it, even if it's something new that uh, you know the guy's hooking me up with that I don't know about. You know, and I yeah. can go like, okay, but I know that his palate and taste is really good and his heart is there and he cares about what's in his own, what he's dealing to people, mm-hmm. you see? So so I think that we can sometimes get uh, doubtful about that. I do and have, mm-hmm. but I don't so much when it comes to fashion now, but in any other thing that I'm, I'm out doing, it's that kind of irks at me, or what's the word? Like it, it, it's there, there's that voice like, are you right? And then thinking about it and just... Like, well, what do I want? What would I like? And then put it there, put it to other people, really works. Mm -hmm. So I would just encourage anyone doing anything that they love to just be all right with that. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, actually, the comparison to the shop to like a record store, where you're, (laughs) you kind of get the idea of someone's taste and you're kind of, I know that when I I drop by, Mm -hmm. you're like, oh, this this thing for sure, you got to try that, that's totally you. And you might get the same thing at the record store. It's like, well, I'm kind of looking for something like this. And they offer a whole bunch of different uh, right. selections that are kind of similar or akin to your taste. And it's kind of nice to not have an AI doing that. You yeah, know? absolutely. It, it, and a, a real person who's like, yeah, try this, Jeff. Mm-hmm. You know, check this out. Mm-hmm. It, and th- again, everything old is new. High fidelity. Yeah. Or, like it's, it's so similar to that. Mm-hmm. That still stands, that film. It's still, it's just so on point. Yeah, it's good. In, not, like, in any genre, not just records. Yeah. yeah, just having the conversations. Like, well, what do you think of this? And then you just have a conversation. Right. It's cool. And yeah. then where does it lead? Like, I can remember we talked about Rio, Duran Duran. Yeah, how amazing. Did, how did we get in <laughs> onto that? I don't know. Was it playing th- that afternoon? I don't even think it was. I think we talked about it and then I'm like, we got to hear that now, you know? Yeah. Like, and then there we are. And then somebody walks in and it's like wow duran duran's play, you know yeah and we both agree it so happens that it's a masterpiece right mm-hmm. so there you go so music I, is obviously a big deal to you 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 play all kinds of genres in your store how did you let's backtrack here how did you first get into music what was playing around the house okay mm. my father is a you know a rock and roll fan a 50s Elvis, Buddy Holly, all that. So that was playing. Jerry Lee Lewis. That was like, he tried. And at the time when I'm four, it really was, it didn't really work. Um, it was the Beatles. So that's maybe the same age. Um, I knew every Beatle. I, like, there was every Beatle record. I cut all the Sgt. Pepper's cutouts out and up living to regret that day now, but I, I did that, but I'm, you know, six. Mm-hmm. I can remember eight tracks of Abbey Road in my room going to sleep at night. When I was a really small boy, I needed to have music playing to, to put me to sleep. Mm-hmm. And it was the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And I became like a, a total Beatle fan. And to this day, I mean, I don't go to the Beatles all the time like I did then, mm-hmm. but that was for me. And the progression was from my father, who also loved the Beatles, of course, but... You know, it's an Elvis man. 
And um, because he was just a kid before the 60s, really. So he's 50s and therefore, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that music was playing. My mom was into like Diana Ross and um, Roberta Flack. Yeah. <laughs> and Barbara Streisand. Mm -hmm. I didn't really give too much of a fuck about that <laughs> <laughs> to put it in front. Yeah, it wasn't. But now... Yeah. Now, no. You know, I want to hear all that. And, yeah, yeah. And then, then of course, just like what was, we all have, I think, like what was playing on the radio while we were stuck in the back seat of the car. So for that, I, I have early memories of ELO and Tom Petty, uh, uh, Olivia Newton John, the Bee Gees. Yeah. You know, all that stuff. Casey and the Sunshine Band. I know that I didn't know the band, but my father's like, you love this song. I used to I also remember if we're going to talk about like what I did mm -hmm. when I could spin 45s on my own. Uh, I remember like wrecking the 45 of Jump and Jack Flash by the Stones. I yeah. just couldn't hear that enough. And Tom Petty, Damn the Torpedoes, wrecked, just played to death. Mm -hmm. Sticks later on, Kilroy was here. Yeah, but getting into the '80s now, we're into Duran Duran. We're into that territory. Yeah, I played that a lot too. We're getting into like, was here. Yeah. yeah, but before that, like playing around the house, it's the '50s rock, and then the sort of like adult contemporary from my mom. And what was the first concert you went to? Earliest concert that I can remember, and I have gone to. I did go to a lot of concerts and shows when I was a kid. The first one I remember was actually a stage show called Beatlemania. And it was a Broadway production that had come to Toronto, and it was what's now the Sony Center, but it was called the O'Keefe Center then. And I, of course, was like six or so, and I was very familiar with the Beatles at that point and loved every second of that show. And my father got us like front row seats for that, and it was fucking awesome. Nice. Yeah, I still remember that, and I sometimes actually go watch footage of it because, it, again, it's just on the Internet somehow. And the guy who played Paul McCartney is like a ringer. It, at the time, there was this whole, there was this whole fascination about how close, how close he was in in playing and capture. Like they captured the music perfectly, mm -hmm. but then it was like, did he have plastic surgery because he looks like exactly like Paul McCartney? Mm -hmm. So that's the earliest anyway concert that I that I recall. And then there's there's lots after, and I was only like five then, so. Okay. Yeah. And then what was, would you say, is one of the more memorable concerts that you went to when you were younger? Hmm. The ones that stick in my memory, and I'm really grateful to have seen, I guess it's kind of a combo of the, the, the two, are Elton John. I saw him maybe four or five times in his mm -hmm. prime, kind of. Um, Billy Joel as well, who are, is a related artist to me. I've seen that amount of times. Then... And I'm just really happy that I did see those guys then. Mm -hmm. Roy Orbison as well. Like, you know, even now, I don't know how many people know who he is, but then, you know, when he, in the 90s and maybe the 2000s, or certainly in the 90s, like before he died, he kind of had a resurfacing. Mm -hmm. And he has legend status among any musician, I, you know, or most. And I saw him four times at Ontario Place Forum. You know, oh, like wow. playing with dark sunglasses, sad about all the tragedy in his life and singing these incredible songs right there, like 10 feet away. I, I get to remember that. It's I'm so happy for that. And, and my grew, father took me to that. And you grew up in a time where like the, the concert culture was very different than it is now. You, you don't have all these kids holding up cell phones, trying <laughs> to capture every single thing and then never looking at it again or posting it on the gram or You're Snapchat. Right. It's comp no, you had to remember that. Yeah, and, and, and actually, and I think yeah. that's why you remember it because you weren't distracted by documenting it. You know, they, there yeah. are studies that show that, you know, all these people that are taking pictures or video of concerts, they don't even remember them. It's, it's weird because they're not watching right. the show through their eyes or watching it through their, it's their so phone. messed. It's yeah. And I, I, I don't track, I haven't, come across anything a lot like as for as far as how artists feel about that but i do remember seeing something somewhere an artist will be hey don't have those at our concert and and then you get into like issues about 
rights and what, what someone can do at a concert. Aside from that, not having like an easy to record device that's acceptable. And of course, in those days was like would have been contraband. You, you'd be, you know, that was the like security reason of the day. Like, is this person holding a recording device? Mm-hmm. Right mm-hmm. now it's like, bring your phone. It's fine. But yeah, what I'm interested in, or what that reminds me of is when I did sneak my 35 millimeter film camera some sometimes to an outdoor concert like at the forum at Ontario place and I, I was so happy to get photographs and it was so hard mm-hmm. to get the you know the the right exposure and the right you know like the lens wasn't quick enough to on this camera to to deal with um concert lighting yeah and stuff right and now of course uh, you, you your phone can do that I'm so happy that I have certain concert memories so let's bring it back to off the cuff All how right. do you how do you decide what kind of music to play in the store Oh, <laughs> is it just whatever you feel like playing top that 10, day? Top five songs for a Monday, man. No, no, uh, <laughs> it's total mood, and yeah. and yeah, sometimes it's fun if if I see. Sometimes I have fun with people. Like if if I perhaps might judge someone walking in, and I'll amend the music accordingly. Um, I'm never out to like piss somebody off, but you know that happens. But. Yeah, it's completely random, and it'll be what I'm listening to at home. I, I, when I get home, I'm I'm always in music if I'm, you know, stationary. So I'm really into headphones and and um, high res audio now. So I'll hear it in the background at work, and play it, and and then kind of really get into it at home. Yeah. I don't, I don't, it's so random. I wish I had like more interesting, uh, a more interesting reasoning there, but it really is. But you keep you know? pretty current with new music too, right? Mm, I mean, earlier I, we were talking about Sufjan Stevens. But, would you say that's new? I mean, he's, he's, he's certainly not like a new artist, but he's new-ish. New-ish. As in that he's been around for the last yeah. Oh 10, yeah. I, yeah. I, I love contemporary music too. I'll try to hear like the latest uh, I'll listen to I listen to J. Cole um, when it dropped whatever a few weeks ago I'm I like a lot of that I kind of here's what's happening because of my fairly recent discovery of high resolution it's like HD television I guess you could you could compare it to for yeah, like 4k who, or something four, like that it's like 4k yeah right it's called a flak file it's basically a pure, uncompressed, clean signal with a whole lot more information uh, than you would hear on Spotify or on iTunes or what have you, or whatever streaming or service. Or even CD. Or even right. CD. Yeah. So CD is a 16-bit <clears throat> piece of technology. We're listening to 24-bit, so that's one-third more of mm-hmm. bit. Mm-hmm. One-third more bits. He's out of 11. No. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so then you're hearing a lot of bottom end, mm-hmm. for any, if you want to get somewhat technical you're hearing a lot of bottom end that that gets clipped in a compression scenario and so i'm hearing old music now because i'm hearing that old music that i know and love as if it's for the first time that's what's occupying my space so Mm -hmm. i don't it's like yeah great rihanna right or whoever Mm -hmm. right now and it sounds fucking awesome because it's made and recorded now Mm -hmm. but Wait a second. Let's go back to that Elton John for a minute. What? I didn't hear that guitar mm-hmm. ever. Yeah. I didn't hear that bass kick. I didn't hear enough. Like, this is all like virgin territory again, and it's just incredible for anyone who loves older music. Mm-hmm. It it really is like rediscovering it, or or I should say, almost like hearing it for the first time, and then you get that feeling that we all know and why we're here again. Like, ah. Mm-hmm. Uh, where were you the first time you heard OK Computer? Yeah. I can tell you where I was for that. And and the chill down my backbone. That's what happens. That's what happens when you hear something in flack or in in 4K or whatever you want to, however you want to, well, technically 24-bit. Yeah. Right? When you hear it that way, you get that experience again. It's like drugs. Yeah. I don't do, I don't do those. But, <laughs> but it, I, I would imagine that it is, you know? 
Well, yeah. bring, certainly my drugs. You bring that, up a good point. Is. The whole, uh, where were you when, when you first listened to this album? Mm-hmm. I don't think anybody has that anymore, right? Even if it's yeah. a, a great it's album, a single, we just don't and remember. it's a collab, and it's featuring, and right. everything's a fucking collab but in more, fashion. But and, more you beyond, know, and that, just, ah. beyond that, it's just music is like the the delivery is innocuous. Right. You know, so we, we might have heard the leak. We might have heard it on a streaming service. Might have heard it in a movie. Yeah. Now it's like, I mean, back then it was, it was really just buying the album or listening to it at the store. So yeah. Or like a friend recommending to you. It's right. like, Hey, you want to come over? I got the new album. Yeah. 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 Or you were at a club. You could have had it happen there or you yeah. were, you were just like in a public space which yeah. is, and then that happened, and you're, and you, everything freezes, right? Mm-hmm. And you have to find out what's going on right now. What is that? Yeah. You know, and it's, yeah, it's ever yeah. more difficult to have that experience. I, Actually, I mean. you know, it's interesting. I, I bought cassettes growing up, and, you know, then after that, CDs, but I remember just going to a shop picking up that piece, I don't mm. know, CD or whatever, unwrapping it, and just like, I can't wait to open this and just listen to it right yeah. away. And get that experience. I mean, it's not really the same with Spotify no. or any of that stuff. No. I mean, you get that with vinyl, right? But, right. you know, a lot of the times I will have listened to something already before actually listening to the vinyl. I, I, I might do right. a comparison, but my first time usually isn't the physical product. Right. But the vinyl, the good, like having grown up with vinyl as we did, you got to open it, you mm-hmm. got to hear the, the shrink wrap crack and depending on how ocd you you were you would open it a certain way yeah right? i usually do it where you rub it on the jeans uh, and it splits <laughs> okay yeah. yeah i just ripped that thing <laughs> i yeah. just did that because yeah. i didn't know better and um and i witnessed people with like razor blades going yeah, down the yeah, side yeah. right and then that would be an extra difficult thing to get this the actual record jacket back into the cellophane so why do that right mm-hmm. just rip that right off and then stick little sticker you know inside the sleeve if you wanted to right or somewhere but um yeah like i it even now i'm not a vinyl guy uh and so i can't really speak to the experience of hearing fleetwood mac or something like of old on vinyl that's Mm -hmm. that's new vinyl Mm -hmm. it still seems to me it would be different because we are different yeah you know and the default way was how how was vinyl then Mm mm-hmm and then cassette, of course, too. Cassettes, yeah. Now you're making me remember how much of a pain it was to open those. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, you're just trying to use your fingernail to yeah, you know, and pick CDs. off the edge. Yeah, like yeah. theft proof, kid proof. <laughs> the only people that can open those things are thieves and kids. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like everyone else can't, right? So I mean, yeah, it's just. It, but it was it was a tactile experience that surely is you know yeah part I mean of, that, part of that the, was part of the experience yeah, really and, just and, taking like a good minute to open that and you're yeah. so excited to like get it open I I think that's there's something to that now that kids don't have anymore right no and Spotify or or I used to use iTunes but they'll give you the artwork right. like on a PDF or something it's nothing like what we're talking about mm-hmm. nothing at all you know yeah the artwork you know? is constantly shrinking like, is it. Well, it seems like that, know. like vinyl used oh, to be sure. very big and yeah. then like yeah. the CD is smaller and then on, you know, now it's like a little thumbnail <laughs> on yeah. your Spotify, whatever, however you're listening to it. That's, that's so right. The resurgence of vinyl is aware of that and, the, and people are giving packages that are like deluxe, awesome, you know, to get that experience in, you know, like a double LP of something with an expanded um, edition with outtakes or live material yeah. uh, included with mm-hmm. a remaster on vinyl. Now, I have I I don't love the experience of hearing scratches no matter how new the vinyl is, so I don't go to vinyl. I prefer the FLAC digital format. Mm-hmm. But from a from a, an experience of getting that you know, looking at artwork, cracking something open, you can't beat that mm-hmm. any other way than mm-hmm. than with you know a, a deluxe or even just a, a regular issue of a, of a record. Are you buying your music like when you purchase them the high res and mm-hmm. so you're playing it like that where you're purchasing the albums? That's right, and not through a streaming service. That's right because I want to hear the full flack. So yeah, what I'm using is 
almost there. And if uh, the way I'm the way I go with it is like if it's something I just want to hear and I know I'm not going to really like archival mm-hmm. kind of and invest in it, I can just go and hear it on title. Just yeah, as yeah. someone might go on Spotify or on YouTube or whatever other way. And I'll go, you know, that's oh fuck, that's really good. Yeah. And I still don't want to buy that because it's a little pricey sometimes too for um for flack. The problem if uh is simply there are two services that I can that I know of to buy trustworthy real flax because there's as an aside there's there's you can just google it and someone will have like a you know a napster kind of thing with flack and it might not be flack mm-hmm. it might not be legit mm-hmm. so the two sites that i know of one is called hdtracks.com and then there's a canadian site which i use mostly which is actually techniques the makers of components and, okay and yeah, yeah so they have a a part of their website that deals with FLAC files and downloadable, and it's in Canadian dollars. It is cheaper mm-hmm. most of the time, in fact, mm-hmm. all of the time, than the American one. And the other problem that I encounter is that I don't have a proxy on my system at home, so I can't even get access to a lot of the titles that are on HD tracks. They have licensing um, issues mm-hmm. in Canada, and I emailed them about that. So it's 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 just... You know, the workaround is obvious. I believe in paying the artist. So I get it on mm-hmm. techniques and it's great. Mm-hmm. So I never, I don't have to shop around really. But I'll, sometimes one will have the release sooner. And if it's something like that I really want, I don't know, when did the last thing happen like that? Certainly it was a Fleetwood Mac, mm-hmm. some of those new reissues. Purple Rain came out last year. Now, how I was think. that? Uh, pretty good. Yeah. At, at the same day, actually, speaking of, we, we touched on, on OK Computer, that dropped that same night Mm -hmm. so i was up till four that morning (laughs) i'm like i'm not going to i won't be sleeping tonight (laughs) no you know and it it was it's the best Mm -hmm. but you know i had to get it right away oh and um uh the 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 um (sighs) reissue remix of sergeant pepper Mm -hmm. also this year or was it last year now how did you feel about that album oh the album or the like the 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 remix yeah the the george martin's son yeah yeah okay it was weird I listening loved to it. that. You I, liked it? Yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I thought, let's just do that to every single Beatle album as soon as possible, uh, Giles. You know, <laughs> like, absolutely loved it. It was, I, I, I've never heard anyone say to the contrary. It sounds like you are. I didn't dislike it. Really? I was just, it was one of those things where you, you see, you know, you see something one way all your life. Yeah. And then all of a sudden somebody introduces a whole other, you know, perspective, and you're like, "Wow, this is this is so different than what I grew up and listened to," you know, multiple times. But like, I yeah, I haven't given it enough listens to be honest. I'll tell you what happened for me with that, and mm-hmm. maybe that can account for why you had a different experience than I did. Sure, I hadn't listened to it in a long time. Okay, and whereas I said before, like I didn't think we'd be talking about this this now, but. I knew that record like the back of my hand and all a lot of us know that record like the back of our hands Mm -hmm. and it can be 10 years or longer since you've heard it but it was a long time since i played that and so it essentially just sounded like the same album to me that was cleaner and more in my ear like right here as opposed to that little wall of distance that is the nature of recordings of that of that era right Mm -hmm. and uh, you know so for me it was just like you know, the difference between organic food and conventional food or HD TV, 4K and standard, you know, it's, sure. it's essentially just amounted to that, which was a good thing. And it sounds like it wasn't the case for you. Like you were able to hear um, louder instruments that were m- more muted or whatever. Right. Like I didn't I didn't I overall got that overall. There was the, obviously mm-hmm. it's like a completely different, but it just still sounded like pepper. Mm hmm but just beautifully, you know, here and present. It was just a delight to hear that. Anyway. Is that your favorite Beatles album? No. Which um, one? <laughs> I have to say Abbey Road, probably, Same. if I have to pick. I, yeah. I always want to say the White Album, because that's like the cool kids say the White Album, right? Is that what yeah. the cool kids I mean, say? The White, I think so. <laughs> yeah. the White yeah. Album. Yeah. You know, for but, me, it's uh, got to be Abbey, Abbey Road. Yeah, Abbey Road has always been my favorite. Not necessarily like the mark of equality, but it just has so much. What the Beatles were, 
and the effect that they had on everything. That's the climax. For me, it's evident in, in listening to it. And I, I don't want to make like a big commentary on Abbey Road. It's just awesome. That's what it, why, it's, why it's the best album, right? And it just works. It's, it's, you still want to like hear those, that drum solo at 2 a.m., you know, or I find with uh, you know? other Beatles records, I have to be in the mood to listen to them. Mm. Abbey Road, I could play it in when I'm in any mood, and I'll I'll be like, this mm. perfectly fits what I want to hear right now. It kind of has all of it on there yeah. too, from like little ditties to heavy metal, right. Almost well, the White Album has starts with heavy, but uh, yeah, it's just it's it works that way. It makes sense to me, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, and I, I, it's an interesting point, like what mood for a beat certainly that's true like early beatles you have to be in the mood for that Mm -hmm. um psychedelic you have to be in the mood for that you know but abbey road works just anywhere you're right i agree (laughs) yeah so i want to talk a little bit about film i know that you Mm -hmm. have a background in film and a lot of your clients are stylists for films and television Mm -hmm. and a lot of your clothes have appeared in different productions Tell us a little bit about how that started. Was it just, you know, word of mouth that these stylists found out about your store and came in? Hmm. And Well, actually, my first film job was the result of a stylist coming to Off the Cuff. And then they were talking to my mom, and I was in school, and I got a job on that movie. And then I worked for that producer for like five years, six years. I don't know what it was now, but yeah. What movie was that? It was called Sabotage, and it starred Mark Dacascos, who later became, he's a Hawaiian martial artist, and he became the emperor, I think is the name of the character, on Iron Chef. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. bangs the gong. Sure. That's Mark. He's got the fancy moves, and he does the intro. uh, yeah, yeah, I have to trust you because I, I don't watch. <laughs> that, that guy's awesome. Seen, yeah, he's a great he's so awesome. martial artist ninja, yeah. and he's super nice. He has and, an um, intense look with his yes. eyes. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but that was he was the, he was in it, and Carrie Ann Moss from The Matrix was in that before The Matrix was made, and then she made another film with us. Yeah, um, but it was a wardrobe stylist for that that um, got me on that path. Yeah. So, what are some films and television shows that? your clothes have appeared oh. from that they've handpicked from the store hannibal um molly's game that mm-hmm. film from this year or last sometimes we get this is rare but maybe back in the day i remember we got peter fonda's suits from some movie he made here mm-hmm. i thought that was kind of cool like easy rider you know yeah, like, yeah peter fonda you know that's that's pretty rad you know there's his suit oh yeah Cool. Mm. So I could tell a customer, like, yeah, that's Peter Fonda's suit there, buddy. You know, <laughs> not too bad. But then but does it turn into a Seinfeld John Boyd's does, car thing, yeah. right? It's yeah. like, oh, yeah. sure, it's Peter Fonda's yeah, suit. Exactly. <laughs> Literally, guy it's, called it was Fonda, a, yeah. that's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> or was it John Void or was it Peter Fonda? John, John it was Boyd. John Boyd, in, but in it's Seinfeld, so. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> that's, yeah, exactly. It does. My life is a Seinfeld episode, really. And, you know, when, when it all comes down to it. Yeah. So um, I can't think of a lot of other... Sometimes they don't say, oh, okay, Suicide Squad, that, that I remember they were getting stuff. Sometimes they don't say because they're, sure. they're not obligated to disclose, you know, what they're doing, like if it's a really top secret shoot or something. So that happens too, and I won't even know. Or they have to say, like, I can't tell you who the actor is. And there you have it. Like, I'm asking about what the size is, but the person who's there knows what they need and can, mm-hmm. can find it for themselves in this case. But, you know, I want to know so that I can be easily helpful for them, you know, or go like, Oh, okay. Right. I know what they're, what they look like, what their approximate size and complexion and everything. Right. So, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's quite a, not a very, you know, momentous occasion really. It's not, you know, when they just come in and check off, check boxes and find stuff Mm -hmm. yeah but i mean as a lover of the movies i'm always very enthralled by that stuff well i know that you have a bunch of your favorite quotes that you hand painted on the floor of your store 
I seem to be in one prong of my life. I, I think um, there's, there's, and this is going to expand into something. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be the floor guy uh-huh. because the first floor was that that I did. Uh, it started off by just trying to get rid of old carpet that was really all like soiled and trampled on over over so many years. And then under it was concrete and all kinds of glue. And then it turned into a movie quotes floor. And I, I, I was inspired by some marker that uh-huh. contractors had written on the original floor, like measurements. And I just went, oh, I could just write on this floor. It would be kind of cool. Put a hopscotch board or something, you know, or something like that. And then it just, so I thought, okay, and then I could put some quotes. And then it didn't really look right. And I thought, yeah, fuck, I got to cover the whole freaking floor uh-huh. to make this look proper and good. Mm-hmm. It's kind of always go big or go home with me. And yeah. that floor was that way. And so it became, you know, it's still not a huge floor. It's 450 square feet. It's not monster, but it took a while and it's that, covered that's in. That's not small, though. Not if small. you're right filling it with quotes, it's it not easy. It took a while. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And, you know, but, um, and I'm, I'm still proud of it. It's certainly, it's getting worn out. And, but it, it was fun and it was really, yeah, it was because of what you said. It's just, hey, wouldn't it be cool to just have all these quotes in one place? Mm-hmm. And then someone comes in with a problem, and you can be like, uh, walk over to there and look down. You know, The answer is, one of the quotes is from a film called Grand Canyon. And the, one of the quotes from that is, um, I think it's Steve Martin's character who says this. He goes, the answers to life's riddles are in the movies. So that's one of the quotes that are on the floor. It's supposed to be this sort of, you know, this is before Instagram too. I might add, so before memes and before every second post being some sort of self-help card. You know, <laughs> that may or may not be true, and and two opposing self-help cards that both sound true. You know, yeah, yeah, c- yeah. can apply. It's very tricky. This is a floor before those times, and you could just you know find your you know solution. Mm-hmm. You know, find the answer to your riddle on the floor. Hopefully, it's a, n- not a big enough floor for all all of life's riddles, but. So I think that's um, almost uh, time for us. You know, in closing, I want to ask you, um, you've been to a lot of great shows over the course of your life. Mm-hmm. If you can, narrow it down to five top five oh, shows. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, which I realize is pretty difficult. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll stick with the Beatles theme for one, because I did in 89 see Paul McCartney. So that was very thrilling for me. It, it, just from just like the fact that it's so in in my blood to love the Beatles and then there there is one that's one mm-hmm. um I would say Elvis Costello at Massey Hall nice um what year was that too that would be that would be oh oh three mm-hmm. oh two oh three two thousand somewhere there he did an a cappella he has a, a one track that I know of that's kind of acapella and he did it he turned off everything and just sang to that room and it was just a you know magic mm-hmm. it was d- d- incredible he's i'm a big fan of his i love costello too so, i saw him for the first time maybe eight years ago yeah yeah he's great he's so great. did you you know you did, you must have loved that yeah and it was that tour where he had this wheel that he spun and it had all his like big hits 50 big hits <laughs> and he would that's just an play interesting, that's a great yeah. yeah oh really and you're like i don't care what it landed on because i'm gonna love that song regardless well, of course right? yeah he has so many great he, songs and so. see so if you were to hear that in in flack in yeah. high def <laughs> right you'd be freaking out you know <laughs> as i am you know i'm hearing king of america or Get Happy, or all of my, these like incredible wall-to-wall awesome records, mm-hmm. like everything, mm-hmm. and beginning to end, it's, right? And you get to hear that for the first time, like who doesn't want that? I'm, I'm measuring this in like, like um, rea- bodily reactions. Sure. That's how I'm gonna <laughs> put this in. I used to, more than these days, love Rufus Wainwright. Uh, so I've seen him a few times, and this is gonna, don't edit this out if you don't want to, or if you want to, you don't have to. But I'm probably like the only Canadian who doesn't really like Leonard Cohen that much. Somebody else was telling us they just don't I'm get like, Leonard I, Cohen. I just, uh, yeah, I don't get him. I'm, 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 I just don't. You know, there's some good stuff like anybody. There's going to be something that I, you know, sure. Mm-hmm. I want Suzanne. I'll listen to it. You know, whatever. Uh, but 
No, I, I'm just not there for for him. No matter what, I'm broke. I'm out of business. I'm a poet laureate. I'm you know I'm now you know I'm not here anymore. Like no matter what tragedy right. of a poet, it doesn't work in my you know for me. Okay. And okay, but but Rufus uh, covered Hallelujah, mm. as have other people. A lot of people, I think, go to the Jeff Buckley right. cover of that as the gold standard. Uh, not me. It's the Rufus Wainwright. Okay. And I saw him perform that two, if not three times. And the first time was at the Mod Club. And I had a chill. I think of the Jacksons tour in 85, just for spectacle. Mm-hmm. Good, Glad that I saw that. Coupled with Springsteen, born in the USA tour then too. Oh. Just kind of happy that I was at those. Yeah. I don't remember much of them, though, except maybe in the case of the Jacksons, a lot of pyro. But, um, <laughs> you know, and Springsteen was like, is this going to end, Mom? Yeah. <laughs> is this going to end? <laughs> yeah. um, I got to just say, like, those ones from earlier, like the like seeing Roy Orbison, seeing people who are dead now. Uh-huh. Um, it just has a, a next levelness to it mm-hmm. now, you know? Simon and Garfunkel reunion, Skydome, again in that category. Mm-hmm. Like, and I had seen Paul Simon a number of times solo, which is also re- really good. But uh, that just really happy that I got to see that when they could still kind of do their thing. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's arguably now if they were to reunite, it wouldn't be. Well, Paul Simon said that this tour is his last. So yeah, yeah. Who yeah. knows? I mean, he's still great. Again, he's like. A go to the guy's yeah. awesome. You know? mm-hmm. Thank you for coming on the show, Lee. It's uh, great talking pleasure, to you. Pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, so it was fun. Where can people find Off the Cuff? Oh, uh, it's the store is at Young and Eglinton, just north of it. You would not be able to see it from the street, so just remember that it's hidden away and down an alleyway. And I have a thing called OTC in the Alley, uh, where just anyone who's cool and unusual or whatever uh we'll take their picture and then tag them on instagram and have fun with that so in fact jeff had that happen to him i did yes yeah on my motorcycle nice epic yes i have a bunch of other stuff cooking and uh, dropping in the coming uh, months it was a pleasure guys thanks a lot yeah 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 thank you anytime You've been listening to Season 2, Episode 7 of This Broken Mixtape featuring Lee Romberg of Off the Cuff. Visit thisbrokenmixtape.com to check out this episode's Spotify playlist. There you'll also find past interviews and custom illustrations for each show. However you're tuning in today, please make sure to subscribe, rate, and share our podcast so we can find more listeners. That would really help us out a lot. If you have any comments, feedback, or ideas for guests, feel free to drop us a line through our website, Instagram, or Twitter. Join us next week, where our special guest is neo-soul jazz singer-songwriter Chelsea Bennett. Thanks for listening. We really appreciate it. Cheers.